Hello, and welcome to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guests are Diane Klein, Professor of Law at the University of Laverne College of Law, and Tobias barrington Wolf, Jefferson B. Fordham Professor of Law at the University of Pennsylvania Carey Law School. They will discuss recent developments in Title IX, the rules governing campus sexual assault, and university disciplinary procedures. So welcome to the show, Diane and Tobias. Thank you very much, Brian. It's great to be on the show. Thank you. It is indeed. Uh, By way of general background, uh, Title IX is a federal law that was enacted in the early 1970s with the aim of ensuring equal access to educational programs that receive federal funding um, and on the basis of gender and ending widespread gender discrimination in primarily higher education in the United States. So most people first learned about Title IX and the first large-scale Title IX uh, enforcement actions had to do with women's athletics on campus, and Title IX was understood to prohibit colleges and universities receiving federal funding from having very large, expensive, uh, fancy programs for athletics for male students while not devoting similar resources to athletics for female students. And for people who work in that area, the effect of Title IX on supporting and creating world-class female athletes uh, in the United States and for Olympic competition and elsewhere has been well-documented. Title IX has done an amazing job of doing that. But what we want to talk about today is a different aspect of Title IX, the use of Title IX to address problems of sexual assault on campus and the understanding of sexual harassment and sexual assault as a different form of sex-based discrimination on campus. So we'll be talking about some new regulations that have to do with the use of Title IX, of federal law, to attempt to reduce the incidence of and punish when it occurs sexual harassment and sexual assault on campus. And the Betsy DeVos Department of Education during the Trump administration has made some changes to the way that schools are instructed to handle complaints having to do with sexual assault and sexual uh, harassment, change the definitions, change some of the procedures. Um, And what I'm hoping we'll have a chance to discuss today is, is not just the details of some of those changes, Um, which are legally technical in some ways, but also to think a little bit more generally about sex and sexuality on campus, its regulation and discipline by institutions of higher learning, as well as by the federal government through the instrumentality of Title IX. Yeah, thank you. Um, So it's probably worthwhile to focus a little bit on some of the key features of these regulations, both the regulations that were promulgated under the Obama administration to address the issue of how uh, colleges and universities deal with sexual assault claims, and then the changes that the current administration has just implemented. And this set of regulations came initially against a backdrop of a fairly widespread problem of universities either reacting with hostility towards people who bring forward claims of sexual assault, um, most of whom are women, but of course not all of whom are women. Um, And even in the absence of hostility, universities simply employing procedures that were inadequate in various ways and that made it excessively difficult for people who had experienced sexual assault to come forward and request assistance. Assistance meaning both uh, some kind of consequence and finding of responsibility for the person who committed the assault, but also various forms of of protection and mitigation that the person who experienced the assault might be looking for. And this is all, as Diane mentioned, this is all under the 
rubric of a statute that uh, is designed to ensure equal access to educational opportunity without regard to sex. And the, the fundamental principle here is that uh, either being hostile towards um, the receipt of claims and the administration of claims involving sexual assault in campus discipline, uh, or having inadequate procedures that make remedies inaccessible, winds up having the effect of denying an equal access to an education in ways that disproportionately fall on women. And, and so that's kind of the larger context in which these regulations got promulgated. And the specific issues that uh, the regulations address, I'll just mention some of them briefly, and I think this will probably be a lot of what we talk about. Uh, they have to do with uh, the way in which a hearing gets conducted when a complaint gets to the stage of a hearing, when a complaint uh, of sexual assault gets filed on a campus, uh, the first thing that typically happens is that there's an investigation performed by a staff member who has a full-time responsibility for uh, receiving and, and investigating such claims. And procedures vary a fair amount from university to university. Be these guidelines impose a lot of requirements, but they still leave a fair amount of room for variation in how the procedures work. But often what will happen is that a staff member will make an initial determination after an investigation about whether there has in fact been a violation of the campus's policy regarding sexual assault and uh, will issue a resolution, will issue a finding of responsibility and a resolution. And uh, whichever party or sometimes both parties who are not content with that outcome, they can then seek a hearing. Uh, and the hearing will typically happen in front of, um, uh, sorry about that, a hearing will typically happen in front of uh, a panel of faculty members. Um, and uh, the hearing is the place where a lot of questions arise about what procedures are going to get employed. And for example, will witnesses be directly cross-examined in the process of telling their story and explaining their version of events? Um, another question that comes up is the standard of proof that needs to be satisfied for a finding of responsibility, whether the standard is a preponderance of the evidence or a stricter standard of uh, clear and convincing evidence. Um, and th those are some of the sort of key issues that were changed by the regulations that the current administration has just issued. Picking up on, on what Tobias had just said, he laid out some of the issues that I think frame some of the concerns on various places on the political spectrum about the process that he described. And one point that I, I want to raise is that Title IX functions in some ways in institutions of higher education, similarly to the way that Title VII, uh, an employment anti-discrimination law, functions in the employment, the workplace context. But I think one thing that jumps out immediately when we think about the kind of process that Tobias was describing is that workplaces do not conduct many trials, I don't think, like he was just describing. There might be a human resources officer or department that would accept and process complaints about sexual harassment in the workplace, but these would typically be taking place between adults who stand in one of several employment relationships with one another, perhaps supervisor and employee, or perhaps peers in the workplace. If the kind of conduct that's involved were criminal conduct, this adult employee would, of course, have the option of going to the police, right? Someone who is, for example, raped on the job would have as an option to go to the police and report this as a crime, and they also might address it in the workplace setting. So similarly, some of the conduct that would be handled in the university setting and might fall under Title IX would also rise to the level of actually being criminal conduct for which one might file a police report and, and seek to have the alleged offender prosecuted. Some of it would fall below that level, probably. But what we are presented with are these parallel processes where Again, as he described, a staff member, not a person who's typically a lawyer, they're not functioning as a lawyer in this role, nor are they a law enforcement person, nor are they required to have special expertise in sexual assault, though they often do. 
will conduct some kind of a proceeding, more or less courtroom-like, and universities have a great deal of discretion about that. And one of the things that I hope we will have a chance to talk about, because it was part of what prompted some initial conversation between uh, Tobias and me about this, was that different universities are very different. Different institutions are very different. And in some settings, there might be reason to have a great deal of confidence in the integrity and competence and fairness of the administrators who are charged with these duties. And in other places, not at all. And so there's a one-size-fits-all-ishness about it that is also a challenge. Well, I, I wonder if it would be helpful to talk a little bit about why the current administration thought that changes to Title IX and Title IX procedures were needed and what kind of response there's been from people who might disagree with that decision. Sure, I'll, I'll start with that. Uh, I'm not going to try to speculate about the decision factors that led this administration to take this action or any other action, but the debate around the uh, procedures that were set forth by the Obama administration focused a lot on whether people who were accused of having committed sexual assault were given enough of an opportunity to challenge the accusation uh, by the complainant in a way similar to what you would see in a criminal trial. Um, a lot of the debate has both uh, made the argument that a campus disciplinary proceeding that is adjudicating some kind of complaint of sexual assault is the kind of proceeding that can have a consequence for the student who's been accused that is similar to the kind of negative consequence that the criminal justice system uh, introduces, right? And uh, I will say at the outset that I find that way of framing the issue to be misguided, and we can talk a bit about that, but there are people of many different political persuasions and many different belief systems who had that fundamental reaction that uh, the absence of the kinds of procedures that would be available to a criminal defendant, like, for example, direct cross-examination of a witness, is um, as opposed to, let me just make clear, direct cross-examination of a witness, as opposed to what many universities, including the University of Pennsylvania, where I teach, does in these hearings, which is to allow witnesses to propound questions to each other, to, to probe and examine their stories, but the questions get filtered through the panel. So it is the panel in a hearing that is asking questions of each witness, both the complainant, the respondent, and if they bring in other witnesses as well. And the panel is both asking their own questions, but then also each person who's involved can submit written questions to the panel and say, I'd like you to ask these questions. And the panel makes a determination about whether the questions are relevant. And then if they think they are, they will propound those questions and ask those questions of the witnesses. So the questions, you can probe the, the, the testimony and the story of the person on the other side of this dispute. Uh, the question is whether you have some kind of opportunity to have a lawyer or some other representative be directly con confronting the person, right? Cross-examining the person in sort of live time in what might be a, a sharp and argumentative manner. And that of course is one of the rights that is guaranteed to criminal defendants in our constitution. Uh, and the argument that many people have made is that that same kind of right should be available to somebody who's accused of sexual assault in a campus disciplinary proceeding because the argument goes, they face consequences that are similar to the consequences that criminal penalties might might entail. And, and once again, I, I think that's a misguided way of framing the issue, but there's a lot of very serious people who, who believe that. Um, and, you know, more broadly, I think, I mean, Diane makes a really important point, and I think it can cut in many different directions, which is that uh, when you try to establish a set of rules for how this kind of process is going to work, you have to be keeping in mind that you're establishing rules for a very wide range of institutions, right? Title IX applies, broadly speaking, to educational institutions that take federal funding, um, including things like uh, subsidized uh, federal Stafford loans. And that includes, you know, massive universities with multi-billion dollar endowments, 
and it includes small colleges with very limited resources and very limited income streams, right? And so figuring out what procedures are going to work for all of those institutions and provide fairness for both students who experience sexual assault and for students who are accused of sexual assault, right? Um, that's a difficult endeavor. And one of my concerns about the recent changes to these procedures, which have sort of ratcheted up more in the direction of what a criminal trial would look like by ratcheting up the standard of proof, which I'm actually not so sure is such a big deal uh, all by itself, uh, but also ratcheting up the kind of cross-examination, confrontational procedures that are available. The question becomes, number one, is a person who experiences sexual assault going to be able to access these procedures? And in particular, is she or he going to be able to access these procedures without hiring a lawyer? And one of the goals of the Obama administration procedures was to make assistance and remedies available to people who've experienced sexual assault in a, in a setting where they're not going to have to go through the expense and difficulty of hiring a lawyer simply to represent themselves and protect themselves in the process, which of course is something that many students can't afford to do. Um, and at the same time, is the institution going to be able to administer whatever procedures are being mandated? And for example, if you have mandatory cross-examination, which the new rules now provide for, then you need to have a hearing panel that can manage and administer cross-examination. And that's a difficult task. And it's certainly a difficult task for a lawyer. Um, it is, I think, a very difficult task for somebody who doesn't have legal training and who doesn't have training in that kind of adversarial setting. And third, of course, are these procedures going to be administered in a way which is fair to the person who's been accused? And that is the set of questions that are always on the table here. And what the new procedures from the current administration do is to move more in the direction of what a criminal trial would look like for these hearings. And my concern is that by doing so, they make access to remedies less available. Uh, they put more obstacles in the way of people who have experienced sexual assault and want to seek assistance from the university. And they also impose a set of requirements on institutions that smaller institutions may have a difficult time complying with. And uh, that was a potential problem under the old procedures as well, let me make clear, but I worry that the new procedures may have exacerbated that problem. I guess where I'd want to pick up on that, and we can talk a little bit about, again, we can, some of the legal technicalities here about raising the, the standard of proof uh, from a simple preponderance to clear and convincing, which is still, of course, below the criminal standard. And that change in the, the standard of proof is not mandatory. If institutions wish to raise the standard of proof, they may do so, but they're not required to do so in order to remain in compliance. But I, I hope that we'll have a chance to discuss, along with some of those more technical matters, including, for example, how cross-examination can realistically and fairly be conducted, especially by people where maybe nobody in the room actually possesses that professional expertise. But I, I hope that we can turn our attention a little bit to some of the some of the strangeness or what strikes me as the strangeness of what's what's happening when we think about these proceedings happening inside of an educational institution. And here are some of the things that that I mean by that. It seems to be a weird hybrid proceeding where we imagine that a, a person who has experienced a sexual assault is on one side and the person accused of having committed it is on the other. That is, of course, not how criminal prosecution works, right? Criminal In criminal prosecution, the victim is one of the witnesses, but it's not the victim right? The victim is not the plaintiff, right? That's, that would be a civil suit arrangement, which might happen in a Title VII type of setting. But even there, sometimes you're suing your institution, your uh, employer for failing to supervise or something like that. And when we think about the remedies 
this kind of brings us back to the first point that Tobias made. Is this or is this not like a criminal penalty? So the range of penalties that we're, we're talking about in an institutional, higher, higher ed institutional setting, at the furthest end would be expulsion, setting to one side whether an institution would make a criminal referral or something like that. But inside the institution, the most extreme remedy would be expulsion. People have a range of views about whether being expelled from college for having sexually assaulted someone is like being criminally convicted of that conduct or is very unlike it. I, I think we can all agree that no one has a right to attend any particular higher ed institution. And this is not a deprivation of liberty and it's probably not a deprivation of property either, et cetera, right? It, it is not at that same level, right? The reasons we have all the constitutional protections for the, the criminally accused person, it's not that. But it's very serious, although I suppose maybe people disagree about that too, right? Ju just how bad a thing it is to be kicked out of school for having sexually assaulted someone, and then how seriously we want to take or think about the possibility of that happening to you when you didn't do it. And that requires us, I think, to, to grapple with something even more complicated, which I really came into focus for me teaching a freshman seminar called The Legal Construction of Sex and Gender. And the, the first issue that we that we do in that class is campus sexual assault and the Berkowitz case, which is notorious in, in some circles but which I use mostly when I, when I teach freshmen to try to put before 18 year olds who are mostly neither legally nor sexually extremely sophisticated. The possibility that in some situations, whether this is true in Berkowitz or not, in which someone experiences themselves as having been sexually assaulted, but the person who did it is not in the fullest sense a rapist, maybe is not in any sense a rapist, because there is a genuine misunderstanding here. And this is not to make excuses for anybody or anything, but only to try to find a way to tell the truth about what happens when sexually inexperienced people are having sex at college, and not think of that only through the lens that we use in criminal prosecution, which, by the way, has its own set of shortcomings around these issues. Well, maybe you could explain the circumstances around the Berkowitz case that you mentioned and how they would or should be dealt with under Title IX regulations as they existed and as they've been, uh, as they've been revised. Sure. And again, it's it's the exact details are less are are less significant, I think, than just the scenario because it tends to ring true to people who are in college and people who have been in college. It is a case of to sum it up in just a few words, semi drunken acquiescence on the part of the young woman. Initially, it seems she's not interested. She does not physically resist. The room is not locked. He is larger than she is. And from the best that we can tell from the testimony, attempting to believe everyone's testimony, at a certain point, she acquiesces. Has she been raped? Should this young man be kicked out of school or as the case may be criminally prosecuted? Because that's actually what happened. It's not a university discipline case. It's a criminal case. And I don't know what I think should happen in a university in that situation. I, I absolutely am a person who believes that everyone who has experienced a sexual assault needs to have their allegations taken seriously, needs to be provided with the support that they need. But I am perhaps more skeptical than, than some people are that in situations like this, we... We have a wrongdoer of the sort that it is appropriate for universities to punish. Not to say that that never occurs, and I don't mean to suggest that at all. There's a whole subcategory of cases involving the extreme sexual misconduct of athletes 
who act with impunity in institutions where the athletic programs of which they are a part are very financially and reputationally significant. There's hardly a worse perversion of Title IX that is imaginable than its misuse to protect misbehaving, mostly male athletes against mostly female victims and so on. But I, I'm concerned with what I regard as an excessive disciplinary function being performed by universities upon the sex lives of their students. So let me let me jump in and um, just separate out a couple of issues that I think it's worthwhile to distinguish between. So one issue is you might think of this as a substantive question about the standard of consent that we use when we define things like sexual assault and what constitutes an appropriate or a, a legitimate and meaningful manifestation of consent. And many universities are moving towards what's often referred to as an affirmative consent standard that requires either through words or through action and context that a person make it affirmatively clear that they wish to be engaging in sexual conduct rather than allowing consent to be presumed in the absence of resistance or in the absence of a statement of no. And that's a super important question. It's not what these regulations deal with, um, but there's no question that it's in the mix whenever we're talking about how sexual assault cases sometimes play out in the context of colleges and universities. Uh, not all cases involve serious uh, ambiguity about consent, but some do, and that's a really important question. Um, a second question has to do with the procedures that a university employs when it actually administers one of these claims. And we've talked a bit about some of the key points on those procedures. I'll just mention that it's, of course, the case that universities have disciplinary proceedings for other infractions, conduct infractions as well, anything from uh, academic misconduct like plagiarism and cheating to physical violence or physical altercations, property damage, so forth, many of which, at least in theory, are types of conduct that could also have a criminal dimension, although they're almost never prosecuted as criminal cases. And those are circumstances, those are disciplinary settings where expulsion is possible. Expulsion is rare, uh, both in sexual assault cases and in other forms of disciplinary cases. But in thinking about you know, how serious is the issue of campus administration of these sexual assault claims relative to other things that the campus does, Campuses are regularly in the position of administering disciplinary proceedings where expulsion or a permanent mark on your record for some kind of sanction and some kind of notation of misconduct is on the table and is possible. This is not unique. What is unique about the sexual assault cases is that they are subject to a different track, as it were, of how they are processed and heard and then the procedures that apply to them because of these Title IX regulations, which apply only in this setting and not in the other settings that I mentioned. And then a third question, and this uh, Diane touched on this a couple of times, and I think it's a really important and difficult question, is does it make sense for universities to be administering these claims at all? And the alternative, which people, once again, of many different political persuasions and belief systems have suggested, is that maybe all things considered, it would make more sense to simply take the administration of this particular type of claim completely out of the hands of the university and to hire, for example, a, a, a third party private entity who is a special, you know, specializes in having the expertise and having the competence to administer these claims and to outsource that work. That, that is a possible solution. It's a solution that would cost a fair amount of money, and particularly if we have a set of procedures where one or both of the students involved are going to want to have lawyers, uh, the question of who pays for those lawyers is a complicated one. Uh, either they pay for them themselves, which may make it impossible for some students to access those procedures, or the university will pay for them, in which case there are additional expense issues there, right? So whether the universities could afford to outsource this work, uh, particularly smaller institutions and colleges, is a really big question. And the second issue, which some people who are listening may care about and some people may not, uh, you know, discipline and standards of conduct within the university 
have traditionally been understood as a matter of university responsibility and faculty governance. And if we did, were to take this one type of, of conduct violation outside the university altogether and outsource it to some kind of expert third party un, uh, organization, then you would essentially be saying that we either don't think we should or we don't think we can adhere to the principles of faculty governance and university administration with respect to this particular set of claims. And I'm not saying that that's not to be considered. Maybe it may, that may wind up being the right answer. Uh, but it is certainly a loss to a value that universities have held to for a long time, which is that the things that make a university a special place require expert educators to be involved in the administration of the rules and conduct regulations of the university, and that that requires governance by the faculty and management by the administration. And it would, it would simply be an admission of failure, I take it, if we say that we have to outsource these claims because universities can't handle them. But you know, the one thing that I'll say about all of those issues is that my priority is to ensure that people who experience sexual assault or who come forward and say they have experienced sexual assault are able to seek protection and mitigation and a remedy and to do so without having to be needlessly re-traumatized in the process and without having to pay for representation they may not be able to afford and that people who are accused of this kind of conduct have a fair and equal process that doesn't stack the deck against them, uh, but that also doesn't allow them to use that process to sort of browbeat the accuser out of moving forward with the process, which is something that we have seen happen a lot in the past. And, and I have some concerns that the new, the, regu the new regulations from the current administration exacerbate those problems. I think there are a couple of things that you said that I think are really interesting. And, and not had not formerly been the lines that I was thinking along, but I think there might be a useful engagement there. My sense is that if it needed to be outsourced to, to a third party, that that third party is the criminal justice system. And what should be happening inside the university would be something more like a restorative justice paradigm, maybe. What's interesting to me is we think, think about the following things that might happen on campus, and these are obviously an oversimplification, but thinking about the role of faculty governance and internal university discipline. Cheating, sexual assault, and a murder. I don't think anybody would say that if you refer the murder to criminal prosecution and you don't use faculty governance for it, that is any kind of confession of failure because it's outside the professional competence of the faculty. At the opposite extreme, I think it's pretty clear to most people that academic integrity violations go to the core educational mission. You absolutely must have faculty determining whether the thing that's happened here is cheating at all, right? Is it the right kind of violation? Should the person get an F for the paper, an F for the course? Should they be expelled, right? The, the range of things that are obviously academic discipline inside an academic institution. And I think part of what is, is interesting and challenging in thinking about sexual misconduct, which of course also has a range, right? We might imagine from, you know, the sexist comment or misogynistic or homophobic speech and also stalking and dating violence and intimidation and online stuff and, you know, revenge porn and all the way, right. There's, you know, a very, very wide range of things. And maybe there, there are a lot of views about how closely related that is to the educational project and thus how appropriate it is that the faculty be involved kind of up to their necks in figuring out how it's all going to go versus thinking these are criminal and quasi-criminal matters that are more appropriately referred to law enforcement, like a murder. Yeah, so I, 
I have to say, I, I actually fundamentally disagree with that way of thinking. And, and my view on the matter is that it is the job of the criminal justice system to administer criminal responses, that is to say, punishment or other responses to criminal conduct on the part of the state. If, if a student commits a murder of another student in a university, it is the job of the university to determine what that student's the perpetrator's status is going to be within the university going forward. Um, it's not the job of the criminal justice system to figure that out. And so I, I just don't think that there's any uh, contradiction in saying that some conduct is conduct that the criminal justice system is likely to respond to vigorously and other conduct is not. And both types of conduct might also be the subject of a university disciplinary proceeding. I, I just don't see any conflict there. Let, let me just, if I may, let me just, let me just say a couple more things, if I may. Um, in the case of rape and sexual assault, uh, the fundamental story of our criminal justice system is one of catastrophic failure. And the, the vastly, uh, overwhelmingly likely result in the case of rape and sexual assault that is brought to the criminal justice system is that prosecution does not move forward. And uh, the question of what kind of... Uh, you know, what, what kind of response a university should have when there is an allegation of misconduct within the university, I think cannot simply be transferred to the criminal justice system with any expectation that there's going to be an appropriate or meaningful response. And the last thing I'll say, I happen to believe very, very strongly in principles of restorative justice. And uh, the processes that a university employs in administering a, uh, a complaint about sexual assault are much closer to the type of harm reduction principle that is the hallmark of the restorative justice uh, approach than anything that you would see in the criminal justice system in the United States. Today, universities do spend a lot of time thinking about mitigation and harm reduction uh, for both parties when it comes to administering one of these claims. And there are sanctions, but there are also attempts to figure out how to reduce harm for both parties involved and for the institution more broadly. And so I, I think that restorative justice principles are a useful point of reference here. And I think that is in fact part of what many universities are attempting to do in the administration of these claims. So to, to take some of the comments that you made maybe in reverse or semi-reverse order, I think probably we would agree that a restorative justice approach is an appropriate one inside the university. But of course, neither the Obama administration regulations nor certainly these new regulations, I think, push in that direction as much as might be wished. I could not agree more that the story of the criminal justice system with respect to responses to sexual assault and sexual violence is a catastrophic failure. That's absolutely true. And it's not at all my suggestion that we can, with great confidence, assume that that will all go as we would wish it to go. We cannot. The question then is, what is the role of the university in that environment? And what I was struck by, to take your first comment last, when you say that, and, and I do not mean to suggest that it would be up to the criminal justice system to decide whether someone should be expelled for murder. What was striking to me, though, was that you seem to hold open the possibility that the university might internally come to a contradictory conclusion of fact than the criminal justice system did in the murder case. And that to me is the university treading into an area in which it does not possess the requisite expertise. And so without getting too hung up on that particular example, in some ways that example highlights the exact same issues. Right? That is, if the criminal justice system has come out one way on the murder, it's very strange to me to imagine the university arrogating to itself the right to come out a different way on the murder. Well, I don't, I don't know why that should be so, because I don't know why that should be so, because the, the criminal justice system employs a standard of proof of a requirement of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And that is a standard of proof that makes a decision that is specific to the criminal justice system about the importance of avoiding false positives and instead allowing for the possibility of false negatives, right? The criminal justice system has made a judgment 
that it is better for somebody who is guilty to go free than for somebody who is not guilty to be found criminally liable or responsible. And much of how the criminal justice system as a formal matter is structured, is, it is structured around that avoidance of false positives principle. As a practical matter, of course, we know that the reality can be very different. But that is the formal posture of the criminal justice system. And so there is no contradiction at all, for example, in somebody being acquitted of a crime and then sued in a civil action by the person who says that he was the victim of that crime and prevailing in that civil action because a different standard of proof applies. And leaving aside the competence question, and, and I acknowledge these are, these are difficult settings in which universities sometimes have to perform fact-finding exercises in ways that are not certainly not their primary mission, but I don't find any contradiction at all between uh, the proposition that a person might be criminally prosecuted for murder and acquitted, and yet a university would find that there's enough of a basis for concluding that this person engaged in horrible misconduct, that they should be removed from the university community. I don't find that to be, in, an, in a case where that's what the facts support, I don't find that to be a contradiction at all. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. To me, I mean, obviously, I, I concede and have to concede, right? The, the OJ case, right? The acquittal for the murder and the finding of civil liability for the wrongful death on roughly speaking the same evidence because of the difference in the evidentiary standard. But my understanding is that it isn't only the don't convict the innocent idea or the balancing that says that it is worse to convict an innocent person than to acquit a guilty one. And the role that that plays in the way that we think about what principles of criminal justice we want to have. There's also the principle that where persons' vital interests are at stake, we want to hold the prosecuting authority to the highest appropriate standard of proof. And where is that in the university setting? Where is the pressure to ensure that the university conducts itself appropriately in administering punishments that are going to have an effect on the vital interests of the students so punished. It's not just my concern that someone might be kicked out of school for a thing they didn't do in some sense. It's where is the appropriate incentive for universities to make sure they don't do that just in order to quell the protest, just in order to look out for their PR, et cetera. And so maybe some of this is just about what our level of fundamental trust is in university administrations and their management of these issues. Well, I mean, as a, if I'm just very quickly in response to that, I mean, look, I, I do not want to suggest that uh, universities are perfect uh, administer, administrators of these claims any more than the criminal justice system is. Uh, as a practical matter, part of the answer to your question is that universities have to worry about being sued. And frankly, it is a lot easier to sue a university if you are somebody who has been found responsible for a conduct violation and you want to argue that in some way the processes were, were improperly applied against you. That is a much easier claim to win than a claim if you are somebody who says that she has experienced a sexual assault and that the university didn't give you adequate access to process if they're following uh, a set of guidelines from the Department of Education. So as, as a practical matter, part of the answer to your question is universities are very concerned about avoiding false negatives, uh, pardon me, false positives, uh, because they're worried about getting sued. Well, so one, one question I was wondering if the two of you might address, because it's been kind of weighing on my mind during the conversation, is sort of how we should think about fairness, due process, and procedure in relation to what these um, in in relation to what these kinds of processes actually look like. Because I, I mean, I take on one side the idea that you know we don't want to discourage people who have been victims of sexual assault from initiating a procedure, and we don't want to put burdens on them that would require them, for example, among other things, to get representation. But, but I have to say that in the context of somebody being accused of a violation, and even of like a violation like cheating or plagiarism, I, I would immediately uh, advise that person to get legal 
representation. And I, I certainly would do so in the case of someone accused of sexual assault. Um, so I mean, like, how do we square those two values? One of kind of wanting this kind of restorative justice, more collaborative approach, but also recognizing that, you know, as as a reality, right, representation would be very likely to result in a better outcome for the person accused. Sure. I think there are lots of different interlocking privilege structures here that we want to make sure that we're thinking about when we consider who is likely to be accused and how that fits into the larger structure of enforcement around these things. I think it is right to say that someone who is accused in a way that places their vital interests at stake would be well advised to be legally represented. I think that connects to this more restorative justice paradigm, which I think we both would endorse. I think people who submit a plagiarized paper are caught doing it and get an F are a lot less likely to lawyer up than someone who is accused of something that is a quasi-criminal form of conduct or a criminal form of conduct that might result in their expulsion. So I think what what punishments are at stake, what range of remedies may be employed has a lot to do with whether or not people are likely to seek representation and whether they should, right? The way that that amps things up. And and of course, Tobias is absolutely right that most universities are afraid of being sued. And he is also absolutely right that suits against universities for these wrongful disciplinary procedures have historically been much more successful than suits by those claiming that schools didn't do enough to protect them. That, that's absolutely the case. But I also think that there are some perpetrators potentially likely to be targeted disproportionately who are also going to have lesser access to the kind of representation that we're talking about. And it's of concern to me, although I don't have the data and it doesn't seem easy to find. And what I'm referring to are things like cross-racial data about accusations of sexual assault and the disciplinary consequences thereof. That data is hard to find. Nobody reports that way, so it will require a different kind of digging and perhaps a different kind of professional expertise than I have to get a sense of whether to take the most paradigmatic case, uh, white female students who accuse black or other male students of color get more favorable outcomes from their institutions than when the reverse is the case and so on. It's a whole other dimension of the thing, which of course has a counterpart in, in non-university criminal justice. So th- those are all very important considerations. There's no question. And, and the particular set of changes that uh, the current administration has put in place, I, I think don't really speak to those serious problems one way or the other. Um, but you know, Brian, to your your sort of broader question about, you know, isn't somebody who's accused of misconduct going to be well served to get representation? Um, I would be very interested to know if it was possible to find out what proportion of people who are accused of serious misconduct at a university do get representation. My instinct is that it's a relatively small proportion. Uh, those tend to be higher profile cases and more sort of socially visible cases in a lot of ways, including the possibility that they may bring or threaten a lawsuit as part of their strategy for dealing with the complaint. But my impression, just purely based on observation and and nothing comprehensive, is that uh, sometimes, to be sure, people who are accused of sexual assault or other forms of misconduct within, within a university will hire a lawyer, but that that's the exception rather than the rule. And so then the question would become, you know, should we have a system where people can get representation in the in conjunction with one of these claims? Uh, both the Obama administration procedures and the current administration's procedures uh, specify that people in the sexual assault setting should have uh, representatives. They don't necessarily need to be lawyers, but people who are advisors to them through the process and who can be with them at the hearing. Um, And now that the current administration has has, uh, implemented this cross-examination process, it is the advisor who performs the cross-examination. The person accused of sexual assault does not get to directly confront and cross-examine the person levying the complaint, him or herself. 
And um, I think that having an advisor and an assistant in this process is an important one. And so one question one might ask is, is it enough to have a trusted figure within the university performing that function? For example, in many universities, when it's a woman coming forward with a claim of sexual assault, uh, there's, there's usually somebody at, like the head of the Women's Center, for example, who has a lot of experience in providing that kind of assistance and guidance through the process and will be the advisor for the complainant if she doesn't have a lawyer. Uh, is that an adequate way of providing that kind of assistance when what is at stake is the administration of a university disciplinary proceeding? I think that's a legitimate question. And, and if we think the answer is no, that you would need lawyers, then the question is, how do you pay for them? I mean, this is the thing. We need a process which is actually able to be administered in a way that gives access to a just and fair process to both parties involved. And if we're going to say that it requires lawyers for both parties, then we have to figure out what the answer is to how we're going to actually make that work. Well, in closing, D Diane, Tobias, I wonder if each of you in turn could talk briefly about what you hope to see going forward in Title IX administration and the procedures around these kinds of, of hearings and sort of if you think think there's ways that we could make them better or more effective, what those would be and, and how we might encourage uh, universities and the, you know, the administration, uh, the, the federal administration to sort of encourage those kinds of developments. All right. <laughs> well, that it's, it's a tall order, especially under the current administration. So I'll, I'll answer a different question than the one you asked because I can give a more optimistic answer. What I would like to see, if I had the power to bring it about, is a much more serious commitment on the part of universities themselves to educate and support their students as they are coming into sexual maturity, independent life, and adulthood, so that the underlying conduct <laughs> doesn't happen so often. Right. What, what we want, I think, is not a better form of administration of justice and discipline for all those campus sexual assaults. It's to have fewer campus sexual assaults, right? to have better communication, healthier attitudes towards sexuality, and a better understanding of what's happening here so that in those cases where university discipline is required, we can be more confident that this is, this is a, a place where the university can meaningfully intervene and an appropriate division of labor between the university and the criminal justice system itself, which I think means a much more explicit focus on restorative justice principles and approaches in the university setting. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to end on a, what is largely a note of agreement. Uh, the, the issue of what steps universities need to be taking. And when I say steps, steps is really an ina inadequate word. Universities need to be prepared to disrupt the expectations of students and of their alumni community when it comes to how they talk to their students and engage with their students about conduct and expectations and standards of behavior and, and moral and ethical norms. And uh, they need to be ready to intervene in some of the social institutions of the university when that is necessary in order to ensure that students are maintaining a certain level of appropriate conduct towards each other. And I think that's a very difficult thing to do. I think it's a thing that requires uh, sustained and, and diligent effort in the face of what will often be resistance and expressions of outrage from the alumni, some, some parts of the alumni community. Um, and I will say this is an issue that I have advocated on a, on a number of occasions about with the president of my own university. And uh, I hold President Gutman in very high regard, and I think that Penn has not yet done nearly enough when it comes to this kind of primary engagement with the issue of conduct of students. And let me also say Penn is not alone in that. I'm not aware of any university or college that has done enough. I think this is a, a, a systematic 
area of inadequacy on the part of universities. And, uh, you know, it should be, it, sh it is a very important question how we administer these claims when they get brought. It should be at least an equal focus, if not a, an even greater focus, to be disrupting the ways of engaging with each other that leads to campus sexual assault happening with such frequency in the first place. And, and nothing in these regulation changes pushes us at all in that direction. And I don't expect any movement from the current administration on that, uh, on that goal. I think that it's up to individual universities to take the lead, and I hope that they will start doing so. Well, Diane, Tobias, thanks so much for coming on the show today. I think this was a really productive conversation. I know I learned a lot listening to the both of you, and I, I'm sure my listeners will as well. Thank you, Brian. It was a pleasure. Thanks for having us. by well-cultivated blushes, and she's happy with a fellow on each arm. Betty Coed has lips of red for Cornell. Betty Coed has eyes of navy blue. Betty Coed's a golden head for Amherst. Her dress, I guess, is white for Georgia, too. Betty Coed's a smile for old Northwestern. A heart is Texas treasure, so to say. Betty Coed is loved by every college boy, but I'm the one who's loved by Betty Coed. She made a wreck of Carnegie Tech and all of its engineers. She did the same at old Notre Dame. Her line is good for years. Roguish eyes. Roguish eyes. Telling lies. Telling lies. Really high. Betty Coed is it the right for Thank you.